Hello, my name is Sophie Yonishkis, and I will be talking about intermittent fasting and why it is not just another example of nutritional misinformation. So in the past 40 years, the diet trends have completely changed. In the 80s and 90s, fat was public enemy number one, and low-fat diets that were high in carbohydrates were recommended. And then in the 2000s, this completely switched and carbohydrates became the food group to avoid, whereas fats were considered healthy. And with each new wave of nutritional advice, people will believe it without much investigation. I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about an emerging diet that has been gaining attention and popularity in the last few years, called intermittent fasting, or IF for short. So intermittent fasting is a very general term that refers to regulating the timing of scheduled eating and fasting periods. So there are many ways to do this. Some people will fast for 16 hours and then eat in an eight hour period, whereas others will eat normally for five days a week. And then for the last two days, they'll restrict their calorie intake. Importantly, following an IF diet means that no food is off limits. So it does not regulate what you eat, only when you eat it. And in the word of Jen Steffens, the author of this book, Delay, Don't Deny, it's all about delaying and not denying. So this is a relatively new concept. So it is important to look at it through a scientific lens. And it is very normal for people to hop on new trends like this, whether or not it has any credible science backing it up. So a few years ago, a friend of mine heard about this new trend called the keto diet and decided to try it out. Um, just for some background, the keto diet prioritizes high protein and fat intake, and it limits, heart, limits carbohydrates um, to practically zero. Um, so in less than a day, my friend had completely deconstructed and rebuilt his eating habits to fit this keto diet mold. Um, so now his morning routine includes drinking a cup of hot coffee with a tablespoon of butter in it. So when I first heard about IF from my mother, I was confused because it went against all the nutritional information that I had been told. So when I was in middle school, I visited a nutritionist at Boston Children's Hospital who recommended snacking between meals. She told me that I should be eating every two to three hours. And on top of that, I had always heard that breakfast was the most important meal of the day. So in her search for more information on IF, my mother read The Obesity Code by the medical doctor Jason Fung, which is all about the science behind IF. And while my mother was reading this book, I decided to do some research of my own on the importance of breakfast. So in my mind, I just wanted to confirm what I already thought was true. I went in seeking confirmation and came out being thoroughly corrected. So according to a Time article by Jamie Ducharme, there were several high-profile research studies done that supported the importance of breakfast. The caveat being that these studies were funded by cereal companies like Quaker and Kellogg. And since then, there really has been no conclusive studies that support the claim that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. So I had totally believed in a nutritional claim that had no reliable, unbiased science backing it up. And this is just one example of nutritional misinformation that leads to so much contradiction in the field of nutrition. So another great but truly horrible example is the USDA's 1992 food pyramid. So if we put these two government-backed graphics side to side, we can see that they are very different. So this antiquated um, pyramid on the left discourages all fats and calls for large consumptions of carbohydrates. While this more recent MyPlate graphic um, supports a more balanced diet. So is IF just another example of this nutritional misinformation? Is it just another trend that would be disproven in five years? In my opinion, the answer to both of these questions is no. So according to Dr. Tello, a practicing physician at MGH and professor at Harvard Medical School, IF makes sense intuitively. So when I eat a meal, the food enters my body and is broken down and used for energy. And any of that leftover energy from food is going to be stored as fat. And insulin is a hormone responsible for transporting sugar into human cells. So when I'm in between meals, my blood insulin levels go down. 
which tells my fat cells to release their stored sugar. So intermittent fasting is based on the principle that if insulin levels go down for long enough, fat will burn off. And Dr. Tello read Dr. Fung's book, The Obesity Code, and she loved it. And she writes in a post on Harvard's health blog that Dr. Fung's combination of research, clinical experience, and sensible nutritional advice in support of IF is compelling. So a huge piece of evidence in favor of the health benefits of IF is that it has been shown to prevent diabetes in people diagnosed as pre-diabetic. So just as some background, being diagnosed as pre-diabetic means that your blood insulin levels are above the normal amount, but below the threshold to be called diabetic. So the University of Alabama conducted a study with a group of obese men with pre-diabetes. So half of the participants followed an IF diet where they ate only between 7 a.m. and 3 p.m., which is an eight-hour interval, and the rest of the group was allowed to eat over the full 12-hour period. So after five weeks, the patients in the eight-hour group had dramatically lower insulin levels, as well as improved insulin sensitivity when compared with the other group. So IF is not just about weight loss. It promotes a healthy metabolism and can prevent type 2 diabetes, which America is currently facing an epidemic of. So the science behind IF is peer-reviewed and appears reliable. But what is it like to follow this kind of diet? Is it sustainable? So for an individual following IF, no food is off limits. So it promotes this balanced diet where anything in moderation is good. People can still eat yummy food when they are doing IF. You don't need to eat a sugar-free, gluten-free, low-fat slice of cake for your birthday. Now, this is not to say that IF ignores all previous nutritional information. In fact, Dr. Fung is very clear in his book that we should all be eating more raw fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and things of that nature. However, the focus is on when you eat and not what you eat. Other diets that focus on restricting certain food groups can make it harder to provide your body with the essential nutrients, which can make them less healthy. Also, restrictive diets are less sustainable, and it's really common to do a diet like Whole30 or, or Keto for a month and then eat all the things you felt like you missed out on as soon as it's over. I also think that it's really important to acknowledge that delicious food is enjoyable, and it should be. People who follow Weight Watchers are known for concocting bizarre and unappetizing combinations of food because they are low in point value. But in IF, people can eat food that they enjoy, which I, being the complete foodie that I am, think is incredibly important. So. Intermittent fasting is a healthy option for people looking to lose weight or lower insulin levels. In many ways, it is more of a lifestyle change than a diet. Meals really are just a societal habit based on tradition, and IF simply calls for their rearrangement. So the history of inconsistencies in the nutritional field can make this area of study out to be unreliable or unsound. The constantly changing recommendations can make it seem like the nutritional field is not built on science and fact, but it is. I'm convinced that IF is healthy because of the reliable research that has been published, and I encourage you to go to check what you think you know, because it is amazing how much nutritional misinformation we have accepted without any resistance. Thank you.